loudly, but now I'll speak softly because I have a mic. So my name is Steve Geik. I'm the president of YU. Um, we're here today to talk about mental illness in the workplace. It's got a few really personal things for me attached to it. Um, my background is nursing in communities, so I've seen it. Uh, I've experienced it myself through addictions. I was the, uh, the poster child for the first addictions program, number one. So that was quite interesting, yeah. Anyway, uh, today we have, I'll just go left to right here. As Erna says, we're in the labor movement, so we always start on the left. Laura Haro is our executive director. Um, Laura has her own interests in this, a lot of it due to um, her thesis. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I haven't read it yet. I told her I'm waiting for the movie, and it's still forthcoming. Uh, Dr. Leo Elwell, who is a psychiatrist by trade and has too many acronyms for me to even I just asked about his work schedule, and, and so I'll let him explain that to you too because. He manages to put about eight days' work into five. So, and Lisa Valens Leduc, who is uh, works at Young Offenders, and uh, Lisa has been trained and delivers courses in vicarious trauma and compassion fatigue. So she's going to speak a little bit to that and uh, take her away. Um, so, do I have to do anything? Just maybe move it near you. I don't know how it's going to sound back there. All right. Um, Again, folks, so thank you all for coming today. This is an important topic to us, and uh, we really appreciate you, uh, you coming here to listen to our panel of experts. Um, please do help yourself to some lunch, and uh, just as a housekeeping matter, uh, if uh, you need to use the washroom, uh, you can just go out through these doors, and I think we have two or three uni washrooms um, just inside the PSAC office there. Um, and I am going to really defer to our experts here to uh, um, lead most of the discussion. I just wanted to uh, talk uh, about some statistics and uh, so that we really understand how uh, mental, mental illness or, or mental health can uh, affect all of us. Um, I'm just pulled some statistics from the Canadian Mental Health Association. And there is a fairly strong agreement that uh, mental illness uh, affects Canadians. Um, about 20% of Canadians at some point in, in their lives, either directly through a family, friend, colleague, that kind of thing. Um, actually, I read in the Canada's mental health strategy that the people affected is more like 40%, and uh, the statistics are that 20% of uh, Canadians are directly affected um, uh, by a mental illness in their lifetime. So, of course, mental illness uh, knows no boundaries, all ages, all demographics, uh, all, all categories of, of wealth. Uh, so certainly, um, you know, it it's, uh, has a broad impact on, on all of us. Um, I'm, I'm not going to read them all for you folks, so certainly I can provide the, the resource later if you're interested. Um, there is, uh, you know, and this certainly affects northern communities much more than others, it seems, but the general uh, rate of suicide, for instance, for uh, youth 15 to 24 is about 24 percent, and uh, people 25 to 44 is about 16 percent, and that you know tends to be related to a mental health issue. Um, when we talk about uh, mental health in the workplace, uh, mental health problems and illnesses uh, account for about 30 percent of short and long-term uh, disability claims. Um, What did it say? 2010 mental health conditions responsible for about 47% of all approved disability claims in the federal civil service, about double the uh, percentage 20 years earlier. And that can be due to sort of people paying attention, but uh, certainly is a, it is a concerning statistic. Um, so on that note, I'm not going to read through all of this for you to death. I'm going to uh, hand it off to uh, Dr. Alwell and to Ms. Wallens Leduc to uh, discuss it further. Okay. Just interrupt for one second and remind people of uh, one thing I was told to remember to say I did. Deborah Sharon Davis is at our communications officer. She's taking pictures. If you do not want your picture taken, uh, just let Deborah know. So, what we would use it for is just um, in the newsletter, that type of thing, just to show. Perhaps online as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad I'm finished with the witness protection program, <laughs> so, so it'll be good. 
Um, you know, one of the things that they talk about is that without mental health, really, we have no health. Um, and that uh, most concerningly over this past week, I was reading about uh, the suicide rate in Alberta having gone up 30% over the last year. And that's entirely due to the uh, collapse of the oil patch in Alberta with everybody losing their jobs and that sort of thing. And um, there's a lot of factors involved in that where um, you know, people don't want to go for help. And yet, you know, employment or lack of employment um, plays a huge role in uh, what I try and treat, uh, both in mental health as well as in addictions. Um, and uh, it's, it's absolutely tragic because when you think about that, that's somebody's you know, husband, wife, brother, sister, cousin, niece, nephew, whatever, um, that has been affected um, by this. But you know, we, we tend not to think too much in terms of humanity, we tend to think better in terms of dollars, and I won't touch on the ethics of that. But mental health costs Canadian employers $20 billion a year. That's huge. Um, one in five people will, as you mentioned earlier, be, and will have it. And one in three out of workplace uh, disability claims is related to mental health or addictions. And it's the number one cause of claims uh, for disability. Um, now, some people say, well, it's not my place to intrude upon this, being the employer or being a co-worker or whatever. And I'd say that it is, and that we have a duty to one another as human beings in the first place. But in the second place, if we just talk about money and about saving uh, the employer money, is that we can decrease the costs and improve productivity and improve morale and make the workplace a fun place if we address mental health issues. Um, I don't know if too many people know about the national standard for workplaces in Canada for mental health, which was developed in 2013. And I'm just wondering if there's uh, any workplaces uh, in the Yukon that have a program up and running in compliance with that standard. Um, stigma is a massive issue that I deal with every day uh, with my patients. And it's not just in the workplace, it's a societal issue. And as I mentioned earlier this morning on the radio, uh, we need to think about how society's attitudes change towards cancer, where back in the day, you know, we almost thought that cancer was like contagious, um, and you'd avoid people who had it, right? They were sick, they were getting thin, and you just like, oh, no, don't want to be around them. And then how attitudes change in society towards HIV, AIDS, and then how things need to change with respect to our attitudes towards mental health. Um, and I see this uh, with uh, my people, my patients, uh, every day, uh, where they've been affected by that. Um, in uh, multiple of my clinical locations, I'm dealing with a lot of First Nations people, and um, I, I'm absolutely thrilled. We've got uh, truth and reconciliation happening, and actually we have a government that wants to try and do something about that. Um, and the rates of suicide amongst First Nations people are way too high. It's uh, a loss to our society. It's a loss to um, uh, Canada. And um, it's suicide and accidental death is the leading cause of death in First Nation people under the age of 45 years. It's number one. Um, rates of substance abuse are way too high, and I would like to put myself out of a job there. Um, finally, with with respect to workplaces, um, what does a high-stress workplace look like? It's where you've got a lot of demand placed upon you, not a whole lot of personal control over that demand. Um, there's a high amount of effort being put in, not much in the way of rewards coming out of your work. Um, you have not a whole lot of support from co-workers or from uh, management. Uh, lack of sense of purpose, lack of trust, especially trust in management or in your co-workers, and lack of respect. And you add all of those things up, it increases your chance of getting a heart attack or a stroke. And that is clear in the literature, it's not made up. You have an increased risk of anxiety, you have an increased risk of depression. And i got a couple other things, but I'm going to pass it off to you. <coughs> Hello, everyone. 
I'm really glad to see a lot of people out here today because mental health in the workplace is so important and I think our community is starting to recognize that and seeking out more information on it. Um, I've done some training on compassion fatigue and vicarious trauma. The, it really affected me quite a few years ago and I hadn't realized what was going on for me and so I was able to attend a symposium in Yellowknife for working with victims of crime. And I met this woman named Francoise Mathieu and she has a website and works with people and they run a, it's called compassionfatigue.ca. There's lots of resources, pamphlets, all kinds of stuff. So what I wanted to talk about a little bit is defining compassion fatigue and what is vicarious trauma, what can our union do to assist us and where can the employer assist us and kind of tie that all together. So compassion fatigue is boiled down to the cost of caring and it refers to the profound emotional and physical exhaustion that helping professionals and caregivers encounter and we can develop over the course of our careers as helpers. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a, a gradual erosion of all the things that keep us connected to each other, like our hope, our compassion, and our empathy. And it's not just for others, it's for ourselves. So we start, we stop taking care of ourselves as well as we should be in order to assist others who need our help and care. We're basically filling up our hearts with stories of hurt and pain, and then shielding ourselves from, from closing the gap in the distance so you start to see that you may not care as much as you had before and be confused about why that is. Why am I having a hard time <coughs> finding compassion for folks when I initially started in the work caring so much? Where does that go? And you can see this in changes in the work site. People are becoming more and more bitter. There's backstabbing, lots of chatter, really dark jokes in the workplace, like dark humor is a big indicator within the field that I work in anyways, with, which is I use corrections and I used to work in group homes and things like that as well. So you start seeing some boundaries and violations in the client boundaries. And then we, we don't develop compassion fatigue because we've done something wrong. We develop it because we care or because we used to. So this is almost, it's considered a, occupational hazard if you're working in a helping field. It's something that will probably eventually happen to everyone who works within that field. Naomi Rachel Remen from the book The Kitchen Table Wisdom words it very eloquently. She said the expectation that we could be immersed in suffering and loss daily and not be touched by it is as unrealistic as expecting to be able to walk through water without getting wet. So there's just no real chance to, to avoid it. So then when we look at things like vicarious trauma as well, which is similar to compassion fatigue, it was a term coined by Ann Perlman and Karen uh, Sackvitney. With the young person or with any client and how you have to open yourself up and be vulnerable to that attachment, which is where the best work can be done when you're working with, with people. They, dis, they describe vicarious trauma as a profound shift that workers experience in their worldview when they work with clients who've experienced trauma. We end up traumatized by the stories of trauma our clients share with us. It comes in the form of like making sure you lock your car doors at night, having intrusive dreams, lack of sleep, those, those types of emotions happening. And the negative, it's the negative effects of empathetic engagement with traumatized clients in their journey of healing. So you're trying to connect with them using your feelings in order to understand where their feelings are coming from. So as much as workers who work out in construction or on the power lines have protective equipment, we also require that in the helping professionals, in the helping professions. So that's where the employer comes in with resources for training, uh, supervision to make sure that people are still doing well, providing resources like EAP, referring people to AA or NA, um, self-help literature, websites, training is so important. In our union, we have uh, confidential advisors who work much like um, shop stewards, sort of, 
and our union advisors are amazing. Thank you, Christy. Um, <laughs> and this is the union counseling is a course offered by uh, the United Way in partnership with Canadian Labour Congress. And we provide a lot of the same uh, things to people, referrals to EAP patients. Our main goals in that is to listen, refer. my colleagues right now for myself and for management because we're all doing a lot of work and we need that patience to to reflect back and see how we can work together to to do the work that we want to do for the for the youth in our care and for the for the people that we care about we spend a lot of time with our colleagues so I guess the, the big thing is to recognize your signs and symptoms to take a breath to slow down try and reconnect with yourself to make sure that you're you're still okay. And I don't know if you have any questions, there's websites and a bunch of books and literature that's available. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Lisa. I guess um, one, of, one of the things that tweaked for me uh, in uh, Dr. Elwell's uh, initial discussion was uh, talking about uh, high stress workplaces. And it is probably not a surprise to many of you there out there that when we talk about uh, workplace illnesses, stress leave, stress illness is not really uh, respected as a, as a legitimate excuse for not working. Um, in, in the research that I've done, uh, and Dr. Elwell I've touched on many of these, a lot of what has been named, I guess, as uh, psychosocial risk factors, and you heard about many of them, um, lack of structure, lack of time, lack of resources, lack of uh, policies and procedures are all things that um, sort of add to the pile, if you will, to add, add strain on a worker. Um, and, and certainly we see that in the union context where people are, are just, you know, maxed out for one reason or, or another and, you know, need to uh, take that breath, as Lisa has said. Um, I guess the, one, of, one of the questions that I pose, you know, first to Dr. Elwell is uh, when we talk about uh, mental mental health issues, um, based on some, some of the things that I have read, there's a, a little bit of a distinction, and you can certainly correct me, it, between sort of having a mental health problem that might be related to a, a temporary uh, thing in your life, like a, a divorce or a, a sick child or a, a sick parent, that kind of thing, versus uh, a mental illness, which is something that has been diagnosed and potentially will be ongoing. So uh, if you don't mind talking a little bit about those two scenarios and also um, when you do have somebody either uh, in, in your workplace or, or really in, in your community who has uh, struggled with a, a mental health concern or with an addiction quite often you know from, from what I've seen what happens is you know like you said there's the stigma but often it's even a much more tangible barrier than that is that is you know a hand in the face that yeah you know we've had enough of you and 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 there is no sort of welcome mat back in even if if they're they're feeling better they're medicated they're whatever so um, maybe if we could talk a little bit about how do we then start to deconstruct that barrier and welcome people back into our workplaces and our communities <coughs> wow great questions um, thank, thank you for sharing um, uh, and I'll, I'll get to some observations on compassion as well in a second. But starting off with you know problem versus you know a full-on mental health yeah. diagnosis. Um, I, I knew about this uh, in a previous life working in the Air Force was that if a person was having problems at home with um, you know the, the spouse was leaving them, the kids were having trouble in school or whatever. Um, 
if we were having something really hazardous happening out on the ramp with a lot of fighter jets coming in or out, and that you have to really have your, your game going because otherwise you can get run over by one of these planes or blown off your feet by it, and you can get hurt just like that. And what we would do is that if we knew that somebody was having tough times, we'd give them some meaningful work but in a safer place so that we could protect them and protect the other people that are out there. And we just did that. Like that was just a matter of course, that wasn't a matter of policy or standard or whatever. And it's like, if you care for one another, and if you see that somebody is struggling, you don't, don't turn your back on them. Just say to them, hey, you know, I care about you. I hear things are going bad or, you know, whatever. Um, and just by being compassionate like that, we can help alleviate a lot of stuff. But workplace says, well, it's not my place to pry into their personal affairs. And okay, yeah, there's privacy in that. And I, and I get that. But just by the workplace being supportive to the person, that does a huge amount for them. And reintegrating them back into the workplace is even more important. So a lot of times somebody goes away for rehab, they're gone from work for months, and you hear you know, various rumors in the lunchroom, oh yeah, you know, they went to Homewood or whatever. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the impression is that this person's broken, right? And then we want to have them back and we want to have them like astronaut grade human being. It's like, <laughs> oh my God, you know, he, we can't have him unless he's perfect. And it's like, give me a break, okay? The person coming back from rehab is probably going to be better shape way better shape because now he or she has got you know way more coping strategies with dealing with not just their addiction but also with life and i saw this in the military because we'd send people away for substance use problems they'd come back and they were a way better employee and they were way more loyal and it was just fantastic seeing the transformation from a person who was having lots of problems at work, and that would be taking up all your time as a supervisor, to all of a sudden now, holy cow, this person's a rock star, you know? But because of stigma, because of misunderstanding, because of uh, stupidity and ignorance, we don't think of these people as human beings, and we don't give them a chance. And that's one of the things that I, I really like people to take away from this, is that if you give somebody a chance, you set up the proper structure for them to have a successful return to work, it can turn out really, really good. And for the people who aren't able to work in a traditional workplace setting, then us as society, we need to set up really good places for them to flourish in. So what I love about the Yukon compared to, for example, Alberta, is, for example, Challenge, where we have a lot of supports provided to people with mental health, and other diagnoses, okay, getting them working again, getting them doing stuff again, and that helps all of my patients that go through there. I just love <coughs> challenge and places like that. On the subject of compassion fatigue, um, I've worked in some really good places and I've worked in some not so good places, and I can sniff the difference between the two of them apart pretty easily now. Uh, for myself, after I've done 10 years of nothing but military trauma, uh, brain injury, and addictions in the military, it was like, I was done. I was finished. I could no longer do it. I was taking it home to my family. I was having nightmares again. I was having all sorts of nastiness going on. And I was definitely, I'd lost my sense of humor. And that can happen to any of us. Um, and if so, you have to recognize that stuff happening in yourself. And then it's like, okay, can I change the way that mental health was being delivered at Canadian Forces Base Edmonton? Not a chance. So um, then it's like, okay, I got to get out of here before it takes me. And um, then uh, wound up uh, going through a couple other places and then wound up here. Um, and uh, compassion fatigue is very, very uh, common. And then we hear about it, for example, amongst paramedics and that. We hear about high suicide rates there. We hear about substance abuse problems among paramedics, other first responders, firefighters, etc. 
Um, the other thing I wanted to just sort of touch on a little bit is uh, the notion of um, how to support uh, youth in transition, especially if they have some mental health problems. Um, so if they're coming out of a young offenders facility or if they're coming out of high school or ILC or they've had a lot of problems with making a go of it in the world, how do we support them? How do we get them into that first job? Um, and uh, how do we uh, keep them engaged in the workplace uh, successfully? Um, you know, one of the things that happens a lot in Europe is that they have a very, very high rate of unemployment for all youth, for all young people. In fact, I think the employment figures for under 25s is like 10%. It means 90% have no job whatsoever. So they keep going back to school, do more training, do more upgrading. But what's going to happen to that cohort you know, in 10 years, 20 years time, right? So as a society, we need to take care of uh, these people and come up with innovative programs to help support them uh, get uh, work in the first place. And if they have mental health issues, to help them uh, successfully cope with that. Um, and that, I think, ties in very well as well with uh, the First Nations uh, people. Um, very historically high rates of unemployment, uh, very historically high rates of mental health uh, problems, and um, I'm really looking forward to uh, some of the stuff coming out of Truth and Reconciliation to try and change that around and to try and to get uh, the supports necessary and to start um, healing our, our world um, and uh, make things uh, better for uh, the next generation uh, coming up and the one that we have right now. And I'm going to turn it over to you. To Laura? To Laura. Do you want to ask you some questions? Okay. Sure. <laughs> it, it is, you know, I'm... It, you, you could talk about it all day because, you know, when you think about how um, mental health has affected us, us all, either personally or, or indirectly at, at work or at home, you know, all of us probably, you know, have examples uh, tickling around in the back of our minds of, of uh, the scenarios where we've been affected. And I guess, um, you know, when you think about where we're at today in terms of, you know, our society and our workplaces and so on and, and in where we're going, I guess some of the challenges that we encounter are, you know, as you, you touched on uh, privacy and, and how do you, you know, welcome people um, into the workplace, how do you deal with behaviors that affect everybody else at the workplace. Um, you know, certainly in the, in the work that we do, when you talk about disabilities in general, certainly there is a lot more uh, sympathy and acceptance for the, uh, the broken leg or the cancer versus the bipolar disorder or the uh, chronic depression or, or any of those things. So I guess my question to, to both of you would be if, if you were to uh, try to give people some, some takeaways, whether they're coworkers or whether they're here you know, as an employer, what kinds of things can we do to you know, be more accepting, um, to sort of uh, still accommodate some of the, the safety concerns that, that come up um, you know, to, legitimize, to make sure they're legitimate, I guess, and to uh, make sure that we have a, a workplace that is, that is safe and accessible for, for everyone. And I guess uh, one of my uh, personal observations, I'm sort of sitting back in the wings, you know, having you know, uh, several children that have gone through the, the school system and, and over the years seeing more and more um, what we call, uh, or what this education system calls individual education plans where there are adjustments being made for children with, you know, a learning disability, a, a language uh, disability, um, all sorts of things. And, you know, these folks, of course, are going to grow up and, and become part of our workplaces. And, and will that shift the landscape as well? So there's a whole bunch of questions all built in. You can tackle any one you want, but uh, just some of the things that we might want to think about. I think part of it we was brought up by Dr. Owell too is talking to each other and recognizing that even though we are in the workplace and we care about our colleagues, I care about my colleagues, 
and I care about people who supervise me. And having those conversations aren't necessarily prying into their personal business. It's basically just, I want to make sure you're doing okay. How are things? And being open to talking to other people as well. Like, I, I have a colleague that we have the cone. You know, when we talk about things, this is, you know, in private conversations to talk about work, but we, we sandwich it, you know, we have something positive, and if we get off on a rant, we make sure to go back and, and find the positive and remind each other about why we are doing the work. The most wonderful thing I saw the other day is a, a colleague who's been away from work for a while, went out onto the floor, we call it, and this youth jumped up from his chair and ran right over to go and see this staff member, because they'd been gone for a while. And so I'll follow up with, with that staff member and say, oh my goodness, you know, the youth really appreciate you being here to just remind each other of why we're doing the work. And check in with your supervisors and stuff if you don't feel that you're getting the supervision you need. For employers, I would absolutely recommend just a five to 10 minute check-in all the time, not just when things are bad, not just when you're making that phone call to, okay, feel free to bring your union, union rep to this investigation meeting where we wanna ask you about these 10 things you did wrong at work. Because they end up with a pile sometimes of complaints and grievances against an employee and the employee may not have even realized that this was happening and that they were doing that and they were being portrayed in such a way to their supervisor. So taking that 10 minutes all the time instead of two hours once a year or once every six months, I think it'll, it'll it would just help so much and I think that's why supervision is so important in the workplace and to do check-ins with each other. Don't don't be afraid because if someone's struggling they may just be waiting for somebody to notice. So I just wanted to thank also for the food for the oh. yeah, <laughs> I was, uh, a few years back I had, um, I co invited um, uh, some people from Vancouver. One was a child psychiatrist with the name of Dr. Wolf. She's quite well known. And a point that she made is that um, the micronutrients in the organic food are more supportive um, uh, for psychological stability than you think was, let's say, McDonald's. She had actually a, 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 lot, a lot of evidence and uh, material uh, uh, compiled. But I, I think it's very informative. I just have to, um, I mean, I can relate to a lot of what you're saying. I mean, I, I have in one of my many careers uh, as a flight instructor, one was one of them, and aircraft dealer. I, can, I really appreciate this. Uh, anecdote from the Air Force and uh, the sort of organic ways of, of dealing with the psychological problems. Like I was uh, sending people on their first solo and they had to have some really sort of uh, common sense uh, on, the, on the spot psychological assessment of these uh, situations. And uh, that, I think that was great. I just have one concern in, in, the broader, in the broader picture, which is sort of, um, I think some biases that maybe in the language phrase that sort of are used so uh, that may be problematic, like the sort of default assumption of mental illness. If somebody wants to kill themselves because maybe it's rational, uh, considering the evils that they face in their, in their sur surrounding. Um, and uh, sort of the general assumption in, in favor of, let's say, the uh, diagnostic statistical manual of uh, mental disorders of the American Psychiatry Association, which seems to be sort of floating in the background, you know bias towards medication. There are a lot of uh, uh, mental health people nowadays that actually try to work outside of, out, outside of this kind of a concept, which can uh, uh, close doors to somebody with psychological problems and um, stere stereotype. Uh, type, type. And uh, you know, that would be kind of elitist, which may be counterproductive, you know, for the workers movement also. For the labor.